This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, good morning, members. Um, we have a quorum and now call the meeting to order. Um, can I welcome members who are participating by video conferencing this morning? Um, and this morning that is Pat Sheehan. And I'd like to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Um, so, uh, moving on then to Chair's business members. Um, we're all very, very conscious this morning of the very serious situation that we're in once again in relation to COVID-19 and the very, very worrying levels of transmission that there is out there in the community. Um, regrettably, we are in a situation where once again we're having to impose restrictions on people's normal way of life and closing schools, which I think every one of us recognise is not the best situation to be in, um, and it is deeply frustrating that we are we are seeing this situation now arise once again. So we are this morning having a briefing from the Chief Scientific Advisor, so he's here today to update the committee and take questions on latest developments and management of the, the pandemic at present. So I will refer you there, members, to tabs 3.1 and 3.2 of your pack, and I would now like to welcome by video conference Professor Ian Young. Chief Scientific Advisor. So, if broadcasting could just bring, yep. So, um, good morning, Ian. You're very welcome to our committee this morning. And good morning. Uh, would you go ahead, please, and give us any remarks that you might like to make? So, as members will be aware, and as the chair has already commented, um, we have seen a fairly dramatic increase in terms of transmission of the virus. Um, since the Christmas period. Um, the average number of cases per day has risen to around 1,800, and that's been associated with a significant increase in the percentage of positive tests, which is now over 20%. Um, the value of R has risen to um, close to 1.8. What we have seen is very much in line with the modelling which was done um, before Christmas and reflects the impact of the two weeks relaxation in restrictions which occurred before Christmas and the um, intergenerational mixing which occurred at the Christmas period. Within the last few days, the increase in cases has begun to feed through to increase pressure on our hospitals. The number of admissions is rising, as is bed occupancy and the number of COVID patients requiring critical care treatment. We hope to see the impact of the restrictions that have been in place since the 26th of December towards the end of this week in terms of a reduction in R and hopefully case numbers beginning to stabilise and fall. However, unfortunately, it's likely that hospital admissions and numbers of patients requiring hospital treatment um, will continue to rise and that the inpatient numbers will not peak until sometime in the last two weeks of January. The impact of the further restrictions which the executive have decided on um, will not be to reduce the peak that is reached um, at present because that peak will be a consequence of the um, relaxations between Christmas and around Christmas, but it should help to ensure that the number of cases and subsequent pressures on the hospital system decrease more rapidly than they would otherwise have done. I'm aware that there's some interest in the extent to which what we have seen um, may reflect the presence of new variant virus within Northern Ireland, and I'll be very happy to take questions on that. However, at present, our view is that the current numbers can be explained simply by the increased contact patterns 
and mixing before Christmas and that any impact of new variant virus at the moment is likely to be relatively small. So thank you, Chair. That's all I wanted to say in terms of introduction, but obviously very happy to answer questions. Okay, um, thank you. So I suppose, first of all, in relation, in relation to that new variant, Ian, you said it's likely to be small. Does that indicate that you're not sure as to the impact of that new variant at the present time? Um, I think that's correct. So um, it's quite complicated to um, diagnose the presence of new variant. There's a, a signal of the presence of new variant which comes from the results of some of the current PCR tests. However, that signal um, is not a definite indicator and it needs to be confirmed by sequencing of the whole virus in isolates which are obtained from patients. There is work ongoing um, with colleagues at Queen's University to begin a surveillance program looking at a selection of cases to establish exactly to, to, to what extent the new variant is present. And we should have some definite information on that within the next one to two weeks. However, at the moment, our best judgment is that the new variant is likely to be present only as a, a relatively small minority of cases. Okay, and in relation to the in relation to the period before Christmas, in relation to um, travel restrictions, what was your what what is your view of the uh, of the the decision that was made to not restrict travel? And is there any progress on the issue that the minister indicated that there would be um, increased monitoring or passenger health locator forms would be looked at? What's what's your view of that issue of travel and and trying to um, Given that this new strain appears to be much more transmissible, given the difficulties we clearly have in the hospital and healthcare and social care sectors, it's obviously crucial that we uh, suppress all all strains of this, but but this new one in particular. So, what is your view on that, uh, Chief Scientific Advisor? Please. So, um, our view was that prior to Christmas, um, it was clear that new variant was almost certainly circulating within Northern Ireland. Um, again, we felt there's a relatively small minority of cases. Obviously, the position with new variant um, in terms of the rest of the common travel area um, has, been, um, has been variable. So we know that new variant um, has become the dominant strain in the southeast of England and is likely to be present and circulating at variable levels throughout England and indeed in Scotland and Wales. Our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland also advise us that they believe new variant is um, circulating there. I think that's almost inevitable given that we know it's been present since at least September in terms of the UK and the large volume of traffic um, between um, the various countries in the common travel area. In terms of why new variant has become established as the dominant strain in some areas but not in others, that remains unclear to us at present. Some of it may be chance in terms of perhaps a um, small number of super spreader events um, seeding the spread of new virus. Some of it may reflect the degree of interaction which has been present in different parts of the country at different times during the last um, few months. Our overall assessment uh, in terms of travel restrictions is that um, we felt that given that new variant virus was already circulating here, and the small proportion of our overall cases which are associated with individuals who've been in other parts of the common travel area in the previous 14 days, that there was likely to be a relatively minor impact in terms of limiting travel based on the presence of other um, restrictions. Um, the issue of um, forms and locating travellers which you referred to, I think particularly relates to um, 
travellers coming in through the Republic of Ireland. Um, I'm not directly involved in discussions around that, but my understanding is that those discussions are ongoing and that the Attorney General is also assisting to try to resolve residual concerns, which I think mainly exist within um, the Republic of Ireland. Well, I understand well, that, uh, that, and that is a concern, and that's obviously something that we are aware that is being being worked upon. But it was my understanding that the minister had said he would be looking into the the uh, increased rollout to try to monitor travel, so that we could trace people on and, and do the isolating that needs to be done in terms of within within the common travel area east west. Has there been any progress on that? So all all cases who are identified um, are asked as. Um, part of the work of the Test Trace Protect Service, whether they've been in any other part of the um, common travel area in the previous 14 days. And there's then um, liaison, um, including where necessary, with public health authorities in the relevant jurisdiction um, to um, trace contacts and ensure that there's a joined up process. And that includes colleagues in the Republic of Ireland and, for example, um, were necessary in Scotland or England or Wales. OK, and then um, in relation to both the fact, both the high levels of spread that we're seeing and the concerns around the new strain, um, what can you tell us in relation to the, the management and the plan for dealing with the situation that we're now currently in? Um, so and I want to know specifically, if I may, um, are there any plans to change guidance in terms of social distancing, given that this new strain is more transmissible? And also, is there, um, in, in, in line with the, uh, the, the motion brought forward by this committee, a significant upscaling, and, and the motion actually with all party support in the Assembly, but significant upscaling of the fine test trace isolating support in order to, when numbers as, as, as are, are brought back down so that there is an alternative to constantly going in and out of lockdown. What plans are in place at this time to do that? Okay, so um, if I deal with those two issues separately, first of all, um, in terms of transmissibility of the, the new strain, various lines of scientific evidence suggests that the new variant is somewhere between 40 and 70 per cent more transmissible than the existing variant and would cause, um, if it became established as the dominant form, a roughly a 40% increase in the value of R at any given level of social interactions. Um, as a consequence of that, then the existing mitigations need to be adhered to particularly carefully to reduce transmission of the, of the virus. The two metres um, which you mentioned um, is a distance which has been based on the distance which um, droplets, respiratory droplets, tend to spread. And obviously that's no different whether they contain variant virus or new virus. Now there is some evidence, it's not strong, that spread can occur over um, longer distances, particularly in a setting where there's an ineffective airflow. And that's why we've been keen to stress so strongly the importance of ventilation and, if possible, open air ventilation um, in enclosed locations where people are meeting. And we'll continue to emphasise that. At the moment, there's no plan on a UK level to consider increasing the recommendation on social distancing. Um, beyond two metres, however. With regard to the test, trace and protect service, um, again, I'm not, not directly involved in the planning and delivery of the service, but obviously the service has evolved um, and continues to evolve um, and develop throughout the course of the epidemic. Um, during the Christmas period, um, the service was managing over 2,000 cases per day at times, and was successfully contacting around 90% of individuals um, within the 24-hour target period. That reflected upstaffing um, of the 
service and planning to deal with the surge that had been um, anticipated. Um, looking at international practice, which we do constantly and experience elsewhere, I think it's clear that whenever there's really widespread community transmission, that no test, trace, protect or similar service can control by itself the transmission of the virus. And even parts of the UK where the service has been held up as gold standard, such as Wales, um, have had an epidemic which has gone out of control and indeed at many stages has been significantly worse than the epidemic in Northern Ireland. So even in the presence of a good test trace protect service, I think there will need to continue to be some restrictions in place to control the transmission of this virus until such time as the vaccination programme is sufficiently rolled out to protect a substantial proportion of the population. I don't think it's realistic to um, think of another approach. But surely, surely that find, are, are you saying the fine test trace uh, isolate and support system is not realistic? No, I'm saying that on its own, um, it cannot control the transmission of the virus in the context of significant community transmission um, in the absence of other restrictions. It yep. doesn't mean going yep. in and out of lockdown, but it, it means that other measures will need to be in place so long as there's significant community transmission of the virus. Yes, and I understand that, but given that we're now in a situation of lockdown in order to get that suppression under mm -hmm. control, and that that is hugely damaging to people in terms of health and social interaction and economy and all of that. When we get those figures down, will, can, you, can you outline for the committee what improvements will be in place to the fine test trace in order to, to then impact once we have the numbers down? Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I understand the, the question. At the moment, the seven-day incidence um, in Northern Ireland per 100,000 of the population is somewhere between 650 and 700. Um, internationally, um, other countries have reported that test trace protect can only really be effective when the incidence is below 50. So um, if we retain restrictions in place until the incidence was significantly below that level, then um, test trace protect would be more likely to be able to keep transmission under control. Um, in order to um, try to reach that point, the service has been increasingly focusing on enhanced contact tracing. Um, so rather than going back 48 hours to identify those individuals um, who need to be advised to self-isolate, the service currently goes back um, seven days in order to try to identify the um, location where individuals will have contracted the virus. And when transmission is at a sufficiently low level, um, the number of those locations which are identified becomes smaller and it becomes possible to actively trace and advice to isolate individuals who have been present at those locations. And that essentially has been the approach which has been taken um, internationally in the countries um, which have succeeded for a whole multiplicity of reasons in maintaining very low levels of community transmission. That's certainly something our service is fully aware of and is um, you know, working to achieve a position where it would be possible to do that once community transmission is sufficiently low. Along with that, it's absolutely vital that we support individuals um, to self-isolate when they're asked to do so. And that support, I think, partly should be financial support, but it's also social support and practical support to deal with issues around loneliness need to access medicines and shopping, etc. Um, those are, I think, really important issues in a context where TTP is leading in keeping low levels of transmission at low levels. 
And that's something which needs to be taken forward on a cross-departmental basis. And my understanding is will be taken forward via the task force which has been established by the executive. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I want to get to members' questions, but I suppose just finally from myself in relation, I'll move on from that. So you had mentioned there towards the end, Ian, about the importance of the, uh, the vaccine. And I think we all do very, very sincerely welcome the fact that, that vaccines are now have become and are becoming available and will play a significant role here in terms of that. But given that that's the case and that the vaccines are so essential to the response and also that our frontline health workers are so essential to the management and, and reaction to the response, there have been recent days significant concern around the fact that the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine, which had been administered to a tranche of, of workers and, and residents in care homes and staff in care homes, that some of those people would not then get the follow-up that was indicated by the manufacturer. And um, I suppose there's a concern among healthcare workers that that, uh, that that is placing them at further vulnerability. They want to have this vaccine administered as per the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, can you tell us, first of all, how my understanding is that the care home residents and staff will still be completed within the three weeks? So how many then does that leave? How many people are we talking about who potentially appointments would be postponed for? So um, again, um, I'm not directly involved in um, the vaccine delivery program, so that's not something I can answer. But you know, happy to seek um, to well, what, seek the well, answer. What, yeah. oh, okay. Well, if you if you if you could provide before the but as chief scientific advisor, what's your view of that of that issue, and, and what can you what can you tell us in relation to the consideration of the appropriateness of that? or the effectiveness of that based on based on scientific evidence so obviously i'm i'm fully aware of the debate which has taken place and the strong views that have been expressed on all sides i think some of the language which has been used around the issue um, is is unfortunate as often in situations like this um, the evidence is relatively complex and the decision is a, a balanced one. However, the evidence has been published and is fully available if people want to take the time and look at it um, through JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination, and through MHRA, who are the UK competent um, authority. Um, Essentially, what the evidence suggests when you look at it in detail is that for individuals who have received a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine, that once that has um, had some effect, which is about 10 to 12 days after the dose has been received, that it appears as if they are 90, they have around 90 percent um, immunity to the virus. And in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, the evidence suggests that, that, that at 22 days or so, that there's absolutely no suggestion of a reduction in that immunity. Um, what JCVI, et cetera, have looked at then is a, a range of other evidence um, in relation to the Moderna vaccine, not yet approved here but which is the other RNA type vaccine, similar to the Pfizer vaccine. And the evidence for the Moderna vaccine indicates that a single dose of the um, RNA based vaccine gives immunity, which persists at around the 90%, uh, around the 90% level for significantly longer. And then they've also looked at the evidence around the AstraZeneca vaccine, which works in a different way, but both vaccines um, encourage the body to produce um, antibodies in an immune response against virus spike protein. So ultimately, there's a similar um, type of resistance to the virus um, which is involved. The balanced view of, 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 of the evidence um, taken after considerable debate by various groups of experts um, has been in the UK that um, it would be reasonable to defer the second dose of the vaccine, and everybody will get a second dose of the vaccine. 
for um, up to 12 weeks. The advantage of that is that it allows first doses to be given to a much larger number of people. And taking everything into account, um, the benefit of giving first doses to a large number of people is going to be greater in public health terms than giving two doses to individuals and increasing their immunity from 90 to around 95 percent. You know, on a personal level, having looked at it and considered the evidence, I absolutely recognise that it's something that can be debated either way and different views might be taken of the strength of the evidence. But I'm content and convinced that the approach which has been taken or recommended in the UK is the best approach for the largest number of individuals in the population and will bring the greatest public health benefit. Okay. Okay. Um, okay and, and I suppose just more, more of a comment, but while that, while that assessment may be, may be certainly something for the future going forward, but the people who, the people who engaged with the program, that first cohort of 33,000 odd people on the understatement, they were getting their follow up in three weeks. I would have thought that it would, be, it would have been fair that, that you would go ahead and do that and pr provide them with that protection, especially given how much we rely on those frontline health staff who are most at, most at, uh, at, at, the, at the impacted by that decision. But anyway, I do, I do want to move on to members, so I'm going to uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this similar to our last session with the Minister members. So there will roughly be ten, nine or ten minutes each, and if members wish to use that for a number of questions or to follow up with the Chief Scientific Advisor in relation to your questions, that's so. I'll just I'll just uh, keep everybody sort of uh, informed of when they're coming close to their time in that respect. I'm going to go first of all to our Deputy Chair Pam Cameron. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Professor Young, for your attendance today, and happy uh, safer New Year to you. Um, I wanted to start off quickly with, and I'm aware that some of these questions might be more suited to um, Dr. McBride, but you're here, so you'll probably have to face them. Um, in terms of um, shielding advice, there's still a, quite a bit of confusion out there. Um, a lot of people still thinking that they're, they're waiting to hear that they are to re-enter into the shielding process. Could you give us some clarity on that and also um, for those uh, who are being advised not to go to the, their place of work if they can't work from home, whether they, um, their original cheating letter covers them in terms of um, their, their employer and any benefits that come out of that. So if you could just clarify that for me first. And also, I wanted to ask around um, children, I mean, children under 16 years of age who previously shielded should they be shielding and uh, that obviously would include whether they should attend school if and when it opens um, physically and also in terms of the under 16s could you tell us if um, those that are clinically extremely vulnerable under 16 year olds with medical conditions whether they might be offered the vaccine um, despite their age because of their clinical needs Okay, so um, I mean, I, I think I'm not seeking to avoid the question, but you're right that it probably would be better answered by um, the chief medical officer. However, um, certainly the intention is that everyone who was shielding previously, given the current state of transmission of the um, virus, would be advised to um, shield again. Um, until the level of community transmission of the virus falls significantly. And that would be regardless of age of the um, individuals. Um, I think that there may be further communication um, going out in relation to that in terms of clarifying the situation. I would believe that employers wishing to do the right thing should accept previous shielding letters um, as indication that somebody needs to um, shield until such time as any further communication is resolved. And with regard to vaccination priority, um, at the moment we're following the priorities um, 
as listed and agreed by JCVI and which are being applied across the four nations of the UK. And those include vaccine being given at a, a relatively early stage to the clinically extremely vulnerable um, in recognition of their risk. Now, obviously, there may be some specific issues for some of those individuals because of the nature of underlying health conditions around um, whether they can receive a vaccine and exactly what type of vaccine they could be given. And those are discussions which need to take place between clinicians and the individuals on a one-to-one a -one basis. Um, but certainly in the interim, I'd strongly advise anyone in that group um, to to have absolutely minimum contacts with um, other people and to shield at present. So just for clarity there, Professor Young, uh, under 16s who are clinically extremely vulnerable, should they attend school if it were open? Um, my advice would be that um, they would need to have it, it, individual discussions because of the nature of the clinically extremely vulnerable group, um, both with the doctors looking after them and potentially with the school can see what be managed. But in general, I would have thought, no, that they should probably not be attending school unless their um, responsible doctor takes a different view. OK, that's very useful. And uh, in terms of the vaccine, whether the clinically extremely vulnerable under 16 would be offered that vaccine, you're saying basically that, um, uh, that basically that body is still looking at that and looking at what a suitable dose would look like? Uh, presumably, so, as opposed to under 16s just been excluded from the vaccination process. Yeah, I think I, th I think the issue is more that the um, the clinically extremely vulnerable, um, in some cases, by virtue of an underlying health condition, will have an immune function which doesn't um, operate normally, and therefore the suitability of different types of vaccine. For those groups, um, for those individuals, needs almost to be considered on an individual to individual basis. But I think there will be guidance to clinicians about the factors that should be taken into account in terms of making those um, decisions or recommendations to individuals. Okay, thank you. And I uh, wanted to turn then to um, vaccination rollout. And very welcome the, the, the two new vaccines, and hopefully the, the third one will come on board fairly soon as well. Um, you may be aware that certainly um, myself and my colleague have called for a 24-7 rollout of the vaccine, where you know, supply is allowing, obviously. Uh, would you be supportive of that call for a 24-7 rollout and whatever that uh, takes to implement that? And uh, if that were to be the case, how quickly would you see the effect, um, how much quicker um, in terms of um, the effect on the population? What, what um, effect would that have? And also, could you tell us um, what percentage uh, of the population would need to be vaccinated um, uh, to see a significant impact on the community transmission? OK, so um, certainly we're committed to rolling out the vaccination programme as quickly as can be done. And Patricia Donnelly, um, as you know, is heading up that and overseeing the rollout programme. My understanding at the moment is that the main factor in term, limiting factor in terms of rollout of the vaccine is actually availability of the vaccine to Northern Ireland rather than um, rather than the extent to which um, vaccinators and the 24-7 vaccination services is available. So certainly I'm sure that Patricia will be wanting to maximise the speed at which available vaccine can be rolled out and will consider all reasonable approaches um, to doing that. And if that was to require a 24-7 process, then I'm sure that's something um, which would be considered. In terms of the effectiveness of the, the vaccination um, and the extent to which population vaccination is going to be required, COVID is always going to be with us. Um, we're never going to move to a world where COVID does not exist, as far as I can see. So um, vaccination is likely to be um, an ongoing process. 
it's, we're still learning a lot about this, but it's quite likely that individuals may need to have repeat vaccines after a, a period of time in order to ensure that they retain immunity. It's also possible that as new variants of the virus emerge, that there may be a need to modify and update the vaccines which are given to ensure that immunity is maintained, as we do every year for um, influenza. So um, this will be something which is, is ongoing. In general, however, the best estimate at the moment is that to substantially impact on community transmission of the virus, not to eradicate it because that's not going to be possible, but the substantial impact on community transmission, we're likely to need um, up to 70%, certainly more than 50% of the population to have been vaccinated and to have achieved um, immunity. Right, that's, that is um, very useful. And I, I would ask if you perhaps maybe take back, given um, the information you've given us there, which is very, very useful. Um, I think it's really important that we bulk up um, you know, our vaccinators and make sure we have as many people in there as possible. And I know I've heard of dentists, for instance, and different health professionals who are more than willing to help out in the process, and they've really been met with either no response or very delayed responses, and also um, with a lot of red tape around um, training, and um, it sounds quite silly training, quite frankly, and I think uh, that red tape issue needs to be looked at to ensure that you know we're not holding back a process unnecessarily. Perhaps you could take that back. I, could, I, I can certainly take that back and say I'm not involved in that. But my understanding at the moment is that the issue is not lack of vaccinators. The issue is availability of, of, of vaccine as the main limiting factor to the speed of the rollout. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I still think if you have the people there ready and if more vaccine becomes available and more new vaccines become available, we should be ready to go with that. But thank you. Agreed. Thank you. And, and I, I would support the Deputy Chair's observations around that, and I think actually it would be incumbent now to be liaison with community groups in order to provide the facilities and the ancillary things that go on apart from just the person who's putting the needle in the arm. You know, you have the car park and you have all those other things. I think in, in, the, in the expectation and the hope that the supply of vaccines will improve, we should be working now to get ahead of the situation. So I think that's useful. OK, I'm going then to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, Professor Young. Firstly, probably could I ask, um, in relation to new variants and mutations, um, is there anything that is being observed at the moment across the four regions that cause concern that a vaccine would not work against it? So, um, new variants of the virus um, emerge all the time and have emerged from the beginning of the epidemic. Um, there's not been a lot of um, public discussion about that, but it has. It is something which has been monitored very closely in the UK. The UK probably does more virus sequencing than any other country in the world in terms of percentage of cases. The vast majority of variants only have minor genetic differences from the initial strain of the, the virus. But as time goes on, it's inevitable, I think, that new variants will emerge which diverge more in genetic terms from the original form of the virus and that then begins to impact on the structure in terms of the proteins of the virus and it's when those structural differences arise and um, which are more than just genetic differences that um, concern may arise about new variants of the virus and um, there was a Danish variant um, which arose in mink farms, which initially was of concern. There's the current UK variant, which has been extensively discussed. And there's a third South African variant, which are the main ones that have been considered at the moment. Um, of those, the Danish variant um, didn't really take off. And in addition, did not appear to be at risk of causing any resistance to vaccine or delayed immunity. The current view of the UK variant is that we also do not believe that it will impact on the success of the vaccination program. There's a little bit more uncertainty about the South African variant because it is slightly greater structural changes. 
and um, that's a subject of ongoing study. The South African variant is not established at the moment in in the UK in any significant um, amounts. And further information, I think, will emerge about that variant in the next few weeks. It is almost inevitable that there will be additional variants in the future, and it is possible that some of those may prove to be resistant to current vaccines. That would not be unlike the situation with influenza, as I said earlier, where the virus changes each year and a new vaccine um, is required. So it's not impossible that we'll find ourselves in a similar position with COVID at the, in the future. But at the moment, we're not concerned about resistance of the variants we know about to the vaccination programme. Okay, and just to clarify, we, we should know within one or two weeks whether or not uh, the vaccination is successful in countering the South African variant. Is that what you're saying? We'll know within the next few weeks, and and that will be um, that will be information based on the biology of the virus and the structure of the virus and observation of the pattern of disease in South Africa. It won't be information directly coming from clinical trials of the vaccine. Okay, thank you, Jan. It's m moving on, obviously, the, the, the hope for 2021 is indeed the vaccine programme, uh, particularly a lot of excitement around the, the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine, given its easier means of distribution. Uh, it certainly causes a lot more hope for an accelerated programme. Uh, you did talk about international best pra practice, and you have mentioned that of the current programme, uh, a 24 7 basis, the biggest barrier to that would be the supply. Um, but it is my understanding that AstraZeneca will be putting two million doses uh, of, of its vaccine into distribution coming from uh, next week or beyond that. So there is going to be a move to, from this manufacturing shortfall towards do we have the means to distribute this vaccine quickly, efficiently and indeed safely. So on that point, is there any other um, barriers towards achieving a 24-7 distribution such as other countries maybe like Israel I think they're now doing it on 10 times faster than that in the UK is there any other barriers that you see here in Northern Ireland as to a quicker accelerated program so um, I'm obviously not involved in the um, vaccine delivery program which is being led by Patricia Donnelly all I know is that um, Patricia is fully aware of the pipeline of vaccine supply and is actively planning and working with colleagues about the most rapid way for vaccine delivery to be rolled out within Northern Ireland. At the moment, we're rolling out faster than England, Scotland or Wales, certainly, and have achieved vaccination of a larger percentage of our population. And I'm, I'm certain that Patricia will be committed to continuing to achieve that and is absolutely fully aware of the importance of getting available vaccine into our population as quickly as, as, as possible. I'm, I'm not in a position to answer um, detailed questions, unfortunately, about um, the lo logistics of that and her planning. Okay. Uh, well, that's, that may be so, and, and thank you for your... I understand that you do meet regular with that senior team as to uh, how that's ongoing in relation to the vaccine. So maybe you could maybe answer the point. Uh, obviously, with the height or the cold temperatures which the vis Pfizer vaccines had to be stored at, are you aware? I've heard concerns across the board of um, some doses having to be dumped at the end of the day uh, because they can't be stored and the seal has been broke. Uh, do, are you aware of the number of Pfizer vaccines that have had to be dumped since the beginning of the Northern Ireland programme? Um, no, I'm not. And actually, I, I, I don't meet with Patricia regularly um, or receive reports in relation to the rollout of the vaccination problem program, other than the headline numbers about the um, numbers of individuals who are being vaccinated and the age group and categories of individuals who have received the vaccine. OK, well, I, I can move on to maybe something that you can uh, shed some light on. In relation to the restrictions that have applied to retail, I have quite a, a degree of sympathy with independent retailers who have seen the disruption to their businesses and they look and are told that there's a level playing field that this is right across the board and we're dealing with some very serious issues in relation to spread um, but they've watched as large multinationals um, are open 
have large numbers attending those shops while selling the same product that they have been closed and barred from selling. So to what extent has the closure of non-essential retail simply diverted large concentrations of consumers to large supermarkets? Has there been any evidence to suggest that? So um, I, I also share your, your, your concern about the, um, the way in which um, the retail environment has um, operated during some of our periods of restriction. And I know that that's also been a matter of concern to the executive and um, that you know, ongoing engagement and work is taking place to try to address some of those issues and to improve adherence to the restrictions. Um, in terms of, of modelling and assessment, we've also always, I think, been very clear that it's not possible in terms of granularity of modelling to go down into subsets of individual sectors and to say what the impact on transmission of virus is in you know, specific settings at that degree of, um, of granularity. What we can do is, is look at um, the number of um, cases or clusters or outbreaks which appear to be associated with particular types of um, environment. We have certainly seen some clusters associated with retail environments of different kinds. In particular, there was some suggestion or signal from large shopping centres of a problem in the pre-Christmas period. We haven't particularly seen any signal from large um, supermarkets or multinational retailers apart from that, but that doesn't mean that we're um, content with um, the way in which um, regulations have been implemented, certainly in terms of their spirit across the retail sector. Okay. And moving on, another issue in which I am deeply concerned about is, Brief, that briefly, of, Jonathan, yeah, is of schools. And, and I do believe that the safest place for young people is within their school setting, despite what has been said across the airwaves in, in this last week to a few days. Could you tell us what scientific evidence showed clusters uh, indeed for evidence to suggest that those schools were unsafe uh, and, and also is there uh, evidence available or being commissioned into the impact on health and well-being among children and young people as a result of further moves to remote learning and if not should, this, uh, should you as the chief scientific officer not be commissioning that research, research now to mitigate against the impacts of COVID long after it has passed this phase? So, um, in terms of, of schools and, and clusters, um, there are two types of evidence, I think, which are, are relevant. Um, firstly, we have seen a significant number of outbreaks in Northern Ireland, um, including some large outbreaks um, associated with schools. And I use the term associated with schools um, advisedly, because often there have been interactions between children or young people within the school setting and interactions between them in social settings. And it's not possible to say where the virus is spreading whenever individuals mix across a, a range of settings and, and contexts. In particular, we've seen larger outbreaks associated with older children um, attending secondary level education, which fits with our, our general understanding of the transmission of the virus, whereby younger children um, are somewhat less likely um, to become infected or to transmit the virus. There's a second line of evidence then, which is more recent and which comes from studies that have been taking place um, across the UK and which has, has pointed to children playing a larger role in transmission of the virus than we previously realised. And particular highlights the fact that whenever a virus enters a household, it's most likely to be brought in by a child who is infected and who has contracted the virus, um, probably in the school or around the school setting in many cases. Children are more likely to be asymptomatic than adults in terms of the virus. 
and hence um, can completely inadvertently bring the virus into a household where once it's in the household, it will spread to adults in the household who are more likely to become symptomatic or develop severe disease. And in particular, in those parts of England where a new variant virus has become dominant, it looks as if um, transmission within schools has played a substantial role in the broader community transmission, um, which is taken hold in those in those areas. All of that needs to be balanced against the benefits and importance of education to our children. And I absolutely agree with you in relation to the best place for children being within schools um, and the long-term potential, long-term consequences and damages to our, our children's futures as a result of a loss of educational opportunity. That is something which we're very interested in and will be commissioning research through the HSCR and Division of the Public Health Agency to look at the long-term consequences of both COVID and the restrictions that have been required on the well-being of our population, including um, children. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go then now, I have in this order, Paula, then Jerry, or Leah, and then I'll go to the phone to Pat. So I'll go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Young. Um, at the start of November, the DERA Minister advised me that he was scoping out an early warning sewage monitoring system for COVID. Um, and he said that the programme would be in place in December 2020. Could you please give us an update on that? Um, is it up and running? And what are the initial findings? Thank you. So my understanding is that that programme is being taken forward um, through sponsorship of DERA. It involves um, researchers within Queen's University, Belfast. Um, links have been established with the Public Health Agency and with myself in the department, and meetings are um, planned to discuss it. I'm not aware that the programme is actually up and running at the moment or that there have been any outputs from it. OK, no, thank you. Just, I'm just, uh, genuinely um, very um, interested in see how that actually pans out. Um, just moving on then, um, the, the issue of self-compliance around self-isolation uh, continues to cause me concern, and I suppose that's how, it, with so much lockdown, that's obviously how it continues um, to spread. Has there been any um, talk about how that can actually be ramped up? And um, Again, we've talked about how people who are self-isolating maybe need a wee bit more emotional and practical support, so can you give us a bit of understanding of how that's being developed? I, I absolutely share your concerns. Um around that, um, both about the extent to which individuals advised to self-isolate are doing so, and also about the support that's available to individuals to do that. As I indicated earlier, I think that support is needs to be multifaceted. In some cases, it will be financial support, but it will also be social support and practical support to uh, ad address some of the potential harms and challenges that come from the need to self-isolate. Um, the executive have established a task force, as you are aware, and one of the work streams of the task force um, is an adherence work stream. And my understanding is that that issue is being taken forward by the adherence work stream of the task force. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was co contacted by a constituent yesterday whose um, long-term partner works for um, the housing executive and one of the um, employees has tested positive, but whenever they looked at the advice on the public health agency around, you know, if, if there's COVID positive case, um, case sorry, in a workplace, that they don't have to close the office down or don't have to close the business down, but that the positive case has to contact contact tracing service. Do you not think that's a wee bit counter um, intuitive um, that the people who have been in close contact should automatically self isolate and not have to wait then till the contact tracing service contacts them to advise them to self isolate? I think that the challenge comes in identifying who constitutes a, a close a close contact, which can be um, which is not completely straightforward. Um, UK wide and indeed I think in WHO terms, we're still working with the definition of a contact who's been at less than two meters um, for 15 minutes or more within the 48 hour period before the individual 
became symptomatic. Um, um, and up to the, the present time, but until they self-isolate, or someone who's shared a, a, a close a contact, such as a, a car, for example, for a, a shorter period of time. So I think it's not always completely intuitive who should self-isolate. Um, and that's why at present the advice is that the contact tracing service should resolve that and as i said they they are achieving and have been achieving over 90 percent of contacts within a 24 hour period so that process is now a, a relatively rapid one having said that um i tend to agree with you that you know if if somebody's positive and you know you've been very close to them for a significant period that you it would be reasonable that people should self-isolate in anticipation of the call from the test trace protect service. Okay. Well, I think the point was almost that the the individual employee, but it's the employer or their management, are, are quite hesitant to allow them not to. But I'll move on. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any update on um, rapid testing at airports? I know that there was some talk about some piloting around that. Please. Um, so, so there has been talk about that being taken forward, and it was being led by um, ONS. Um, in scientific terms, it's it's something which um, has been actively discussed and continues to be actively discussed. Um, rapid testing at the airport itself um, would not um, provide sufficient confidence that an individual was infection free to allow them to avoid the need to self isolate. There are two models which are being looked at um, in terms of pilot studies. One is that individuals are required to self-isolate and are tested somewhere between five and seven days. And based on a negative result, they can then release and no longer need to self-isolate. The second model, which is being explored in a pilot, is that individuals do not self-isolate but are tested every day and only um, isolate if they get a, a positive result. We're keeping the results of those pilots under review, and if one or either of them prove to be effective, then that is something we would absolutely consider introducing in the future, probably on a UK-wide basis. Okay, thank you. And finally, for me, it's it's regarding the um, vaccination. Um, obviously, the health and social care staff here employed by the trusts are being brought forward. But obviously we're hearing that domiciliary care workers or allied health professionals, dentists, pharmacy staff who are providing health care but aren't necessarily in an independent setting, aren't necessarily employed by the trust. At what stage will they be called forward? Because they're providing frontline services, but it's just unclear. I'm getting a lot of queries around that. Yeah, so so um, we are following the JCVI um, proposals and priorities in terms of vaccination. I'm not sure exactly where those groups will fall on that list, but um, I'm happily, happy to take that back and seek clarification from within the department about when those um, calls might go out. Okay, and just finally, just just remember one last thing. Um, I, I was contacted by one of the hospices here, and it's about those people who are actually terminally ill and, and are at that very um, advanced stage of palliative care. Obviously, they know they've only maybe weeks or months to live, and obviously they want to be able to see their loved ones. Is there any way that the terminally ill could even be brought forward a bit quicker as well? I know um, it, it's a difficult one, but I just think in terms of their, their quality of life at the end of life. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's an interesting point. It's not one that I'm aware has been um, discussed. And obviously, depending on the nature of an illness, um, there may be specific circumstances which mean that, you know, some of those individuals would not respond in a normal way to, to vaccination. So I'm not aware that that's something that has been um, considered at the moment. Okay, but well, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Paula. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Professor Young, I'm very concerned about the delay of the, of the second dose of the vaccine, uh, similar to the Chair and others. Um, it will be health care workers, frontline workers will be impacted, and the BMA have obviously called it a breach of trust in terms of the rescheduled plans. And To be frank, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, the CA, our Chief Scientific Advisor isn't being more robust around it. Pfizer have stated that there's no data to demonstrate the protection after the first dose is sustained after 21 days. So I would like to ask, um, I know you've given your, your general view 
uh, on it. Um, what process, what input do you uh, or the CMO have to the JCVI um, process? So the, um, the JCVI process is um, an independent process um, with a, a range of experts from, um, from a, a variety of settings who look at the evidence independent of policy makers and, um, make, and make recommendations. So we have no input into the JCVI consideration, although obviously I have you know, carefully reviewed the JCVI discussions, the evidence which they've published, the evidence published by um, MHRA as well. Um, the issue has been discussed um, at SAGE and SAGE is in general has been, I think, supportive of the approach that has been taken. I note as well that independent SAGE who have um, attended health committee previously um, are also supportive in the, current, in the current circumstances of the approach which has been taken and as are a number of other relevant bodies, the British Society for Immunology, for example. Um, WHO, I think, have recently suggested that from their view of the evidence, they're content that countries need to make a, an individual decision based on their epidemiological circumstances, but that's certainly up to six weeks gap between the um, vaccines is something that they think could be supported by the available evidence. So I think, I think to say that there is no evidence, as Pfizer have said, um, is, is absolutely not correct. And anyone who reads the relative published documentation from JCVI and elsewhere would realise that there is some evidence. Well, just Having to, said that... Yeah, just to, just um, to follow up on that, I mean, the BMJ have said there's no evidence that WHO my understanding is that's not their position. They're quite uh, concerned that there is a lack of evidence to, to back this up. And my concern really is that we have a, a vaccine that is affected, and the BMJ uh, have said vaccine efficacy could be compromised uh, if this strategy uh, is pursued. And obviously, we have a situation which could be placing healthcare workers at risk, but also we have a worryingly uh, increasing rise in people who are um, opposed to vaccines, um, and that could potentially give succor to those. Uh, you know, uh, disingenuous, but uh, widespread concerns that exist in our community. So, how would you respond to those uh, those issues? So, as I think I've said, I mean, I absolutely recognise that um, that that this is a balanced decision, and that different views can be taken of the available evidence, and uh, a range of views have been expressed, often in language which I think isn't particularly helpful in a situation where the decision making is nuanced and relatively complex. Um, all I can say is that having reviewed the evidence myself, I'm content that um, the decision that has been made is in the best interests of our population as a whole. Remember that if we immediately give second doses of vaccine to those who have received first doses, then um, every time we give a second dose, we're denying somebody else the opportunity for a first dose, and they remain at risk for a significantly longer period. And that's the balance, I think, which is um, trying to be struck, struck in relation to considering um, the overall evidence and what's in um, the best interests of the largest number of people and the overall public health response to the epidemic, given where we are um, at the moment. Um, and how would you, know, you, I, I, how do you re would you respond, uh, Professor Young, to the concern raised uh, that there may be a prioritisation of senior management over frontline healthcare workers in regards to the um, uh, the rollout of the, of the second uh, dose of the, of the vaccine? I'm absolutely not aware of any suggestion that that would be the case and haven't heard any suggestion that it would be the case. Um, I, would be, I would be surprised. That would make no sense to me in scientific terms. OK. 
Okay, thanks. Just there was a concern raised about that um, by I think it was the BMA. I think yesterday. Um, in, in regards to the um, cur partner rules, uh, Professor Young, uh, will, will they still um, cur uh, partner rules in, in car homes? Will they still continue uh, throughout the period of, of lockdown at the minute? Uh, do you understand? So sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Yes, the, the cur partner rules for for people in car homes will they still continue? Uh, in the period of lockdown that we're in at the minute, uh, you mean sort of? Do you mean visitors going in to assist with car in 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 car homes? Yeah. So the department issued a statement, I think October time last year, saying there should be car partner uh, pathways established in car homes. They, they obviously don't exist in, in every car home, but uh, do you understand or do you know whether that will continue uh, in the period of lockdown that we're um, entering into? Yeah. So. Um Obviously, there will be significantly greater risk, and my understanding is that um, there's been very variable implementation of those pathways um, in different care homes um, throughout throughout Northern Ireland. I think that needs to be a, a risk-based uh, assessment. I'm not directly involved in that, but I'm sure that further guidance will be will be given through the department. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Orlea. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Professor Young, for all of your um, answers so far. I just wanted to bring it back to um, some of the remarks, the questions that the Chair had asked earlier around the travel. Um, and I'm just wondering, you have mentioned, Professor Young, that um, pre-Christmas, um, when you were looking at uh, the different issues around the new variant in Britain, um, that there was some of the advice was around that there would be a small likelihood of us actually reducing um, the spread of transmission because the new variant had already um, reached the, the island of Ireland, um, which is which is fair enough. But I'm just wondering when we got the briefing from um, the last briefing we had from uh, Robin Swan and Michael McBride just before Christmas. I know the minister had touched on when we were asking him a question around this. Um, he was speaking about the risk of food and medicine shortages um, that that would ha that 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 was coming across that that would be the greater impact when you were trying to obviously balance the decision to um, prevent travel from Britain um, or do not so I'm just wondering um, so was the advice was it a balance between reducing the spread because the variant was already here or was the, the greater risk the food and med medicine shortages and would this still be your um, what would be your expert um, view at the minute and where we're at presently with our, our levels of transmission and on the issue of travel thank you so um, I think I think the issue of travel is is always a, a complex one and um, first of all in general terms um, when you have an individual moving from a, a, an area of higher prevalence to an area of lower prevalence there's always a risk that um, to the area of lower prevalence in terms of introduction of the, the virus and that has varied at different times during the epidemic there have been points when Northern Ireland has had the lowest prevalence in the common travel area and points of time where we have had the highest prevalence in the common travel area and we're rather closer to that at the moment. So um, it's, it's always been a, a complex picture and movement across the common travel area has been and remains extremely important both to everyday lives on the island of Ireland and across the common travel area in terms of movement of goods and services. So the advice which we have given has always related just to the transmission. The advice I give always relates just to the transmission of the virus and the risk of that. And that advice always needs to be weighed against the harms that would result to society. And um, for example, in border areas in, in Ireland or across the common travel area in terms of movement and goods and services and the executive and Minister Swan in terms of making decisions and recommendations about travel need to weigh up those factors. So there was absolutely some risk um, from movements in the travel area of introducing further um, infection, including of the novel variant to Northern Ireland in the pre-Christmas period. Because the variant was already circulating here, my advice is that that risk was relatively small and needed to be weighed up against those other factors. 
Thank you, Professor. So your, your, your current view at the moment then, would it be the case that a travel ban um, wouldn't be necessary given our rates are so high at the moment? So um, in terms of introducing novel variant, um, there remains some risk of introducing further novel variants Northern Ireland through movement, um, certainly from parts of England, Scotland and Wales and probably also from the Republic of Ireland. In terms of spread of virus, um, the risk of movement to those other areas from Northern Ireland is probably rather greater to them than to us, because, for example, our current prevalence is much higher than the prevalence in Scotland. So somebody moving from Northern Ireland to Scotland would bring some additional risk to Scotland. Again, that needs to be weighed up against all of the other factors that I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. Um, just moving on to my next question. Some of this was touched on earlier by um, Jonathan, um, but just around the education um, issue. I know that the, the SAGE group um, had met in November and December. Um, I'm not sure if you attended those discussions, um, Professor Young, but I know that the, the education and the schools issue was discussed on the 4th of November and the 22nd of December. So if you did attend those sessions, um, could you maybe just relay when um, you provided your own scientific advice and guidance to um, our health minister and education ministers following those meetings? So I haven't got those um, exact dates whenever we provided advice. I say we have been meeting regularly with um, and providing advice to education and I know that they were provided with advice um, shortly after, um, if not in fact before, um, the relevant SAGE meetings in terms of the discussions at SAGE and the implications of, of those discussions. Okay, thank you. Um, and just my, my final question, and maybe just to, to follow on um, from some of that. So I'm conscious that obviously you, as our chief scientific advisor, um, that you know you have a, a major role in, in carrying out some of the modelling work and, and providing this important advice to our executive. Um, but outside of your own role, um, Professor Young, is there have you a team that works around you here in the north to help provide? Um, support to yourself in, in this important work and I'm just wondering you know if you could provide us with who who does that um, consist of so who is your support team around you that actually sits down and works on our own modeling for for the the six counties um, and I know that you know some of the modeling you had touched on earlier around the, the schools and how you look out for the clusters and the young people and um, you know bring them into their households but maybe if you could maybe just finally touch on some of the modelling that's being done um, currently, the modelling that we're, we're working off around the ICU bed capacity, because um, I'm just conscious that with where the rates are at, um, that's probably the most worrying thing for us all at the moment. Okay, so um, um, within within the department, um, I, I, I don't have directly a, a support team. There are two key advisory groups with whom I work. One is um, a group called the Strategic Intelligence Group, which um, reviews all of the relevant papers from SAGE from a Northern Ireland context and in addition, additional papers um, which we generate ourselves or obtain from the literature. And that group includes um, some individuals from within the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, and our two universities. Um, the second group which um, I work with is um, the modelling group. And the modelling group um, includes individuals from the Strategic Intelligence, sorry, the Strategic Investment Board, um, Queen's University, Ulster University, and the Public Health Agency. In addition to those specific Northern Ireland groups, we work very closely with modelling groups UK wide and regularly exchange information with um, colleagues in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so we have a range of different models 
um, which produce figures for Northern Ireland um, coming from our own modelling group, which is the one I rely on, and then from modelling groups based mainly in um, universities elsewhere in the UK to whom we provide data and to provide modelling which feeds into our overall discussion. So there's quite a, a complex um, process and backup around this. Um, included in the modelling that we produce are um, short to medium term projections um, in terms of pressures on our hospital system. And this week um, we have provided updated um, short term modelling running to close to the end of January, which lo looks both at admissions, hospital bed occupancy and likely ICU occupancy so that the trusts are aware of what is likely to be coming down the line. As I've said, my expectation is that those numbers will probably We just lost you there, Professor Young. Okay, we'll just uh, give broadcast in a couple of minutes to see if we can get Professor Young back on the line. Mm. Well, now I ask Pam the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Remember where he stopped over there, can you? I can't always take a note. Dropped <laughs> <laughs> off now altogether. Broadcasting have advised us it's easier if uh, if they remain not live. So I think we might have Professor Young back now. So Professor Young, could can you pick up from where you uh, where we lost you there, please? Yeah. Um, apologies, Chair. Um, my my computer went into update mode, so I, I was luckily I've had to switch to another one. Um, the joys of modern. The, um, indeed, indeed. The. So I think I was at the point where we're saying that we'd provided short to medium term projections to the trusts in terms of admissions, bed occupancy, ICU occupancy, that I don't expect those to peak until the last two weeks in January, but that the trust should have a reasonable idea what's coming down the line. Unfortunately, our trusts are going to be under very severe pressures um, for the remainder of January. And it's vital that we all continue to adhere to um, the mitigations in place really strictly in order that those pressures can reduce as quickly as possible. Just a small point very, of very clarification. Quickly, Professor Young, thank you. But see the, the, the short term modelling that you have um is that you have drafted up this week. Um is that the first that you have included the impact of the new variant um from Britain, or was any of that contained within the modelling before Christmas and thank you again. So at the moment, we don't believe that new variant is making a significant impact on transmission of the virus. So at present, we haven't needed to include every any separate allowance for new variant. Now that is something that has the potential to change quite quickly. And whenever we provide the modelling, we have indicated at a note that we haven't taken into account into new variant new variant and that if it does become established, we will have to provide updated modelling, which shows the effect of that. Okay, thank you. And uh, just uh, I'm conscious now that we are getting close enough to time and we all, I'm sure, have a very busy day ahead of us in the Assembly as well. So I'll go now to on the phone to Pat Sheehan. Pat, go ahead.
Yes, that's me now, Chair. Yep, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Professor Young, I want to revisit the issue of travel and travel restrictions again. And could you explain the public health consideration <laughs> taken into account when you gave advice not to impose travel restrictions? So, um, the decision whether or not to impose um, travel restrictions is a, a policy decision. It's informed by um, scientific public health advice, um, and it was certainly informed by my advice. Um, the advice, as I've indicated, was that there would be some benefit in terms of putting in place travel restrictions, but it would be a relatively minor one, specifically in the context of new variant, since new variant was already circulating within Northern Ireland. And whenever we initially gave advice, we said we weren't sure that new variant was circulating. And we said that if new variant was not circulating within Northern Ireland, then there would be a much stronger benefit in terms of imposing travel restrictions from areas where we knew new variant was present. So even though the virus, according to Matt Hancock, was out of control in the southeast of England, uh, on the basis of public health considerations, you felt that the advice you should give was that it was still safe for flights to come in here and passengers to come in uh, unrestricted. So could, could you explain to me, was that, did, did that advice and the outworkings of it, uh, was it beneficial to the public health of citizens here or was it detrimental to the public health of citizens here? Um, in terms of advice that I give in the context of the epidemic, I, I've, I've said before that I would never advise anything is safe. And I certainly did not um, provide advice that said that it was safe not to impose travel restrictions. I said that the benefit of imposing restrictions if new variant virus was circulating in Northern Ireland would be relatively low and needed to be weighed against um, the other considerations which we've mentioned earlier um, in this meeting. So m movement of goods, uh, including food and medical supplies, etc., and also um, everyday life and movement in the context of um, the island of Ireland. So, therefore, what you're saying is that the outworking of the advice that you gave not to impose restrictions was actually detrimental to public health here. Would you agree with well, we don't have any evidence of detriment as a result of that. We have continued to keep the number of cases associated with travel from throughout the common um, travel area in Northern Ireland um, under a close review. And the percentage of cases which are associated with travel has remained at a very low level and hasn't risen um, as a, a consequence of the Christmas um, period. And, and even though the virus was out of control in the southeast of England and flights were arriving in here, a number of them on a daily basis, you don't think there was any significant risk to an increase in the transmission rate? And leave aside the, the new variant, uh, you, don't, you don't think there was an increased risk? So I, as, as, I, as I think I indicated earlier, you know, I, I do think there was some risk, um, but I think that the risk was relatively small. And throughout the course of the epidemic, there's always been some risk to Northern Ireland when individuals move here from areas with a higher prevalence of the virus. Similarly, at the moment, when people move from Northern Ireland to areas of lower prevalence, there is some risk to those areas. Okay, as fair enough. Ireland. Fair enough. Yeah, and I heard you saying that earlier on. And I just wanted to, to come round to the overall strategy, and I suppose one of, one of the points in any strategy is, and particularly those countries that have been successful, is that they all have travel restrictions of one sort or another, uh, and, and, and we don't. And I accept at the outset of the pandemic we were dealing with a novel pathogen. We didn't know much about it, but we've had a year now. Uh, and I would have to say, uh, I don't know what your strategy was, uh, whatever strategy yourself 
the Chief Medical Officer and the Minister have come up with. Would you agree with me that it has failed abysmally? I think that I think that the strategy for dealing with the virus is is something which is informed by scientific um, advice. Um, you know, strategy and the measures that have been taken have been decisions of the executive, um, and um, have been informed by advice, and I think will continue to be informed with advice. Do I think that we have done well in terms of the epidemic? I think it's I think it's very difficult to compare um, different um, countries, different cultures. You need to take into account both the structure of health and social care services and the way in which people behave culturally, I think, as well as the geographical and other factors. And um, it's very difficult. Do I wish we could have done better? Absolutely. Would there be decisions which I think could have been taken differently um, with science, um, looking backwards? Without a without a doubt, and I'm sure that decisions are those, uh, Professor Young. Which decisions would have been taken differently? So I think that I think that right towards the beginning of the epidemic, um, on a, a UK wide and Ireland wide basis, um, there might have been some merit in taking action around travel. Um, at that stage before the virus had become very well established um, in the country. That's one thing I think certainly that we would look back and and think might have might have been done differently, although those are policy decisions and they would have been informed by advice. I wish that we had got the testing um, developed more rapidly and rolled out more rapidly given all the limitations um, of it, because I think more testing earlier in the epidemic would have been very helpful in terms of trying to keep it under better control. So those are, are, are two examples, and that's a personal view that I'm 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 giving. In and, and, and and what about the modelling? For example, the chief executive of the PHA told us that you were responsible for the modelling, which woefully underestimated the number of positive cases in so, October. And during the summer, I mean, you talked about earlier on that when, uh, unless the transmission rate falls below a certain level, uh, contact tracing becomes much less effective. But during the summer here, we had numbers in single figures, and yet the contact tracing operation wasn't beat up. Now, the chief executive of the PHA blamed your uh, modelling for that and the woeful underestimation of the number of positive cases. So what do you have to say to that? I think that the, the modelling um, which has been done um, is never a prediction of what will happen in the future, as we say. But in fact, the numbers which have been predicted by the modelling have been remarkably um, accurate. Um, and that the information provided to the PHA via a member of the modelling group um, suggested I think that there would be around 300 cases at the end of September and 1,200 at the end of October. And if you look back at the numbers that were the case, that both of those were extremely close to the reality. In terms of the um, first period and um, the advice that was given um, in line with best international practice was that um, we would need to have, uh, um, based by international standards, that we were likely to require 300 to 500 contact tracers to um, run the contact tracing program. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, just, uh, Pat, Pat, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to have to move. Uh, I'm going to have to move on. Sorry, there, Pat. Sorry, sorry, moving, sorry, just, moving, Pat, I, ha I have to move on in terms of time. Um, I'm moving to Alan. Yeah, you've had about nine minutes there, Pat, already. I'll give you a very quick point. I'll give you a very quick point. Uh, and and uh, topic up, sir. so you've said mistakes were made uh, in the strategy this year. In the time ahead now, can you explain uh, and outline what the strategy is going to be to tackle this far? Um, so, um, in terms of our approach to the virus, obviously restrictions have been imposed 
um, at the moment to bring the acute um, spread under a degree of control. The key um, platforms that we'll be um, using strategically in the future, first of all, the rollout of the vaccine programme, which is remains the most important element. Secondly, we're looking carefully at the potential for um, for the use of more rapid targeted population testing in, um, in certain settings, although that's something which I think the role of needs to really be proven at the moment and various pilots and experiences are underway in the UK. And then I think the issue of adherence um, is critical and that's being taken forward, not through the Department of Health at the moment, but through the task force headed by the head of the civil service. Okay, thank you. Go on ahead now to Alan. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, I have about three or four topics. I'll move through them as quickly as possible. Um, could I just ask the, uh, the professor that um, what I know there's been a lot of uh, complaints at the moment and moans and groans and understandable about the, uh, the new restrictions. Um, could uh, the professor just uh, reiterate uh, what would be the immediate consequences? of not imposing uh, these tighter restrictions over coming weeks? So um, at the moment, we expect pressures in our hospital system to peak in um, mid to late January uh, at a much higher level in terms of numbers of inpatients and ICU occupancy than we have seen to date in the course of the epidemic. If the new restrictions were not in place, then the danger is that those numbers would plateau at a very high level, probably for two to three months minimum, and before we began to see benefit of vaccination and possibly seasonal effects in terms of the course of the virus. So the main benefit of um, the current additional restrictions will be hopefully to and reduce those pressures more rapidly and to reduce the pressures on our um, health and social care workforce who will be facing enormous challenges over the next few weeks. Thank you. I do, I do appreciate that the executive have been quite generous uh, in terms of the financial aid that they've tried to get out to businesses, but there's still a lot of businesses that have slipped through the net, and, and I think the executive do need to recognise that in coming weeks and, and try and get support out to those who, who really do need it. Uh, just moving on to vaccination, um, you said, Professor, earlier that the rate of vaccinating is controlled by uh, currently by the availability of vaccine. Um, will that restriction uh, on your ability to, to rule out the vaccinating uh, programme, will that continue or will the supplies of the vaccine uh, as production uh, raises, uh, will the, the, the vaccine become more available and allow you to ramp up uh, the level of, of vaccinating. And also, uh, do you uh, envisage um, uh, going forward that uh, the public may require uh, an annual uh, booster uh, of the vaccine, maybe, maybe administered along with their uh, flu uh, injection? And in terms of the new strategy of the single dose, um, we talk about a 12-week period, uh, Professor. Is that 12-week period, is that currently set in stone, or is that a flexible figure? Is that the maximum? I mean, are there people who may well receive their second dose uh, within six weeks, as, as opposed to having to wait the full 12 weeks, or will the 12 weeks be the, 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 the new norm in relation to that? And how will you, uh, how will you measure uh, the success of this strategy. Obviously, the proof of the pudding will be, uh, will be in the eating, as it were. Uh, but uh, how quickly will you see that that, uh, that, that uh, strategy is actually uh, paying dividends? Uh, and can I put on record that I certainly I support it. Uh, I can't wait to get, uh, even if it's 70% uh, percent protection, I can't wait to get my first uh, injection. Uh, and to reiterate what you said earlier, I, I know that a lot of people here in the committee do p place a lot of faith in the independent sage. Um, and I do note, as you noted earlier, uh, that they have come out uh, with full-hearted uh, support uh, for that strategy. 
So, um, in terms of vaccine, then we do expect supply to ramp up rapidly um, as the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine um, comes on stream. And the UK also has the potential to introduce uh, a number of other vaccines over the next few months. So we are likely to move to a position where vaccine supply is not the critical issue. And as I indicated earlier, Patricia Donnelly, I'm confident, is working on mechanisms to maximise the delivery of um, vaccine to ensure that it can be rolled out as rapidly as possible to as many as possible of our population. Um, the the twelve week period uh, in terms of delayed second dose of the Pfizer vaccine is a, a maximum, and I think it's likely that in practice that most um, individuals who do a second dose will receive it sometime before twelve weeks, and um, certainly perhaps around ten weeks, um, if not um, earlier. And we. Um, in terms of the future developments around the, the vaccine, there are a number of things around vaccine that we're not sure about at the moment. One is how long immunity persists after the current dosing regime of the, the vaccine and when a, a booster might be required. Um, there's been variable experience with other similar viruses. Sometimes the immune response to the vaccine um, persists for a number of years. In other cases, um, a regular booster is required, and that's something which um, will come out of the results of follow-up of the patients who've been in the early vaccine trials. So we'll certainly know that um, before the year is out and be in a position to determine what um, additional um, vaccination strategy will be required in the future. I do think that it's likely that um, vaccination against this virus will probably become a routine for most people. Yeah, and, and moving on to uh, the track and trace uh, program, uh, Professor, uh, you did mention figures there of uh, it has to be below 50 and 100,000 really to be effective. Is there a danger uh, that uh, we can become fixated with the importance of, of, of uh, uh, tests and trace? Uh, and during periods of, of, of high transmission rates. And my, my final topic really was uh, in, in relation to the new date that has been set for the transfer test by the AQE uh, in February. I'm just wondering, uh, did they consult uh, with the uh, department uh, in relation to this new date? And is there any evidence uh, in your modelling uh, that the situation around transmission rates will be significantly different uh, by the new proposed date uh, for the AQE tests at the end of February? Um, in relation to the um, to test trace brand protect, I, I absolutely think that test trace and protect is a vital part of our response to the, the virus. And I think it's become increasingly more effective um, over the last few months and is now achieving very high levels of success in terms of um, speaking to cases and contacts within a 24 hour period, which was the goal that was set for them. I think that that is a, a tribute to enormous hard work by colleagues in the public health agency. And a lot of credit is due to them for achieving, achieving that. However, you are right, I think, in that it is just one aspect of response to the epidemic. And as I've indicated, the international view um, is that once you get over 50 per 100,000 per seven days, a test trace protect service will find it enormously difficult to keep that under control. And we are so far above it now. Um, that um, you know the, ser the service is making an important contribution, but the additional measures are, are essential. So it is just one aspect of what we're doing. In relation to the question around AQE, I'm not aware of any contact between AQE and the Department of Health about their proposed um, date. 
and all I've seen is what has been in the um, media. Um, I note that according to that, at least they said that um, that it was provision, a provisional date and would take into account um, the public health situation at the time. Um, I think it's too early to say whether the, what level of transmission of the virus will be in the end of at the end of February. I hope it will be much lower than it is now, but I suspect it will still be significant. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to point out for the record, members, this committee has never actually been addressed by independent sage. There are some academics who have attended some of our, our uh, expert panels who have been members of SAGE. I actually think they have pointed out specifically during those sessions that they were there in an individual capacity. Um, I would also note that the, the, the two very good international panels that we have had indicated a number of concerns across a range of issues, including the absence of a robust fine test trace isolated sports strategy, including the absence of a properly coordinated All-Ireland approach. So there are a number of issues that have been raised but it's not true to say that SAGE, independent SAGE, and in fact, I think we, we may have had some members from mainstream SAGE as well, but uh, I just want to correct that for the record. Um, Chairman, I, I, I don't know whether you're referring maybe to the remarks that I made. But no, I, Alan, I'm referring to the, I'm referring to the remarks that, that ever, including Professor Young made at the very outset. Okay. Um, so I just, want, I just want to make that very clear. Um, so we're moving then to Chiara. Go ahead, Chiara, please. Thank you, Chair, um, uh, and thank you, Professor Young. That was very informative. Um, given the, the recent issues surrounding schools, uh, my question pertains to health in an educational uh, setting. Um, I'm aware at the moment that there's a pilot uh, operating in Limavati to do with testing in a school setting. Um, can I just ask a question on the cooperation that you've had with the Department of Education in relation to a testing and tracing program uh, going ahead in schools, uh, as I know it would po positively contribute um, to getting our children back into schools and um, feel safe? Uh, I know that we've seen in England a very ambitious plan uh, surrounding testing, and it was rolled out. But can you give any detail on discussions that you've had with the Department of Education on this? So, um, at the moment, there is a, a schools cell um, within the public health agency, which liaises with schools in relation to um, outbreaks and positive cases, and provides advice on a um, a school by school, case by case basis. Um, we have had ongoing discussions with the Department of Education about the potential for various approaches to reducing the risk associated with attendance at schools. And as you say, they have included some discussions around um, testing pilots, and those a pilot has been taking place around Limavadi to look at the effectiveness of that. The programme, which has been rolled out in, in, in England, um, I think has been done um, with still some uncertainty around how effective it would be, and we hope to be informed by the results of of that. Um, I do note that in the case of the Limavadi pilot, um, there was some reluctance in the pre-Christmas period um, for individuals to undergo repeat testing. So, um, you know, clearly this is something that needs to take place um, with full consent of um, both staff and pupils um, involved if we're to try to see whether it's likely to be helpful or not. I've, I've, I've an open mind at the moment on how effective it would be. Um, I would like to see more, more evidence before we engaged in a, a widespread rollout, which would require full cooperation from the Department of Education. Thank you very much. Um, my next question uh, refers to, it's more of a long-term uh, question as we come out of COVID. Um, we've seen how COVID-19 has undoubtedly had an impact um, you know, from a mental health perspective. I know recently when I'm speaking with young people, um, there's, that everything's kind of changed. They're doing their university classes at home. Um, many have young children. It's created a list of issues. Um, my question is, understandably at the moment, we know the priority is um, public and physical health. Um, but are there any discussions uh, on a long-term basis around supporting the public and their mental health as we come out of COVID? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and in particular, um, there's been interest in supporting both the general public and um, healthcare workers 
as a particular group who've been exposed to uh, a large amount of stress as a result of the pressures in the in the system. Um, various pilots and projects have been proposed um, to the Research and Development Division of the Public Health Agency and um, several studies have been funded and will continue to be funded and supported in the future as we move out of the um, out of the COVID epidemic into a situation where it's more of a, a chronic background um, disease. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I know you'd mentioned um, you're not directly involved with the vaccination rollout programme, um, so I'll contact Patricia Donnelly on this as well. But, um, you know, I welcome the news that over 40,000 people have been vaccinated so far. But uh, just on the topic that was touched on previous by other members um, and the logistics surrounding rollout, uh, in your opinion, do you think it would be ben beneficial uh, for current COVID testing sites to be reallocated or expanded um, and be utilised as uh, vaccination sites, given that it has the infrastructure to deal with um, you know, large population? So um, I know that that's something which has been um, discussed. Um, one of the challenges is that we're going to need the existing testing sites um, to remain active for quite some time while we're rolling out the vaccine. And what we don't want to do is to take any risk of mixing healthy individuals who are receiving vaccine with symptomatic individuals who are undergoing testing, um, because that might run the risk of um, spreading the, the virus. So um, I think, and again, Patricia would confirm this, that it's mainly going to be different um, vaccine um, delivery centers which are under um, development. So we think probably those processes will be kept separate. Thank you. And then lastly, just off the back of that, um, I think it's really a, a valid point that you've raised around the concern and the complexity of mixing um, both those in need of a vaccine and those who are positive. Uh, do you think that um, you know innovative ideas like drive-through vaccination centres would be beneficial? Absolutely, and um, and those again, I'm sure are, are something which will be which will be looked at. Um, it depends a bit on the nature of the the vaccine. One of the limitations of the Pfizer vaccine, for example, and we've we've talked about the cold storage, but one of the limitations is the need to keep people under observation for at least 15 minutes after they've received the vaccine. And that's not really compatible for with I think with with drive-through vaccination centres. However, um, with other types of vaccine, I think different approaches will be possible, and I'm sure will be considered in the future. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, thank you, members, and thank you, Professor Young, uh, for coming along today and for answering the questions uh, for, for the committee. And um, I'd like to wish you and all your staff a very happy new year in the in the very difficult times that we face at the at the present time. Thank you, Professor Young. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, I am conscious that the uh, ad hoc committee is due to start at twelve o'clock in the in the assembly chamber. So, moving on then to any other business, is there any other business today? Sarah, can I ask? I know the health minister is due to make a statement, and we haven't received it yet this afternoon. But I think every one of us have questions about the vaccination program rollout, and I'm just wondering, could we invite Patricia Donnelly yeah. at the earliest opportunity? Clearly, she knows the finer details, and um, to come before us because I think we all have a big long list. Yeah. Yep. Possible. Thank I you. think members agree generally with that. Yep. Jerry first, now we'll go to Pat. Yeah, thanks. Just to say, Jerry, I think that, that format is, is working better, you know, in terms of getting uh, information and questions out uh, for the most part. So I think uh, if we can keep to that sort of strategy going forward. Okay. Sure, sure the intention anyway, but I just think it's it's a good format of, of using time, so thanks. Yep. Thank you. Pam. Uh, Chair, can I agree with uh, Paula's suggestion there? But I, could could we go a little bit further and maybe and write as a committee? to the Health Minister and ask him to um, consider a 24-7 rollout of the vaccine and ensuring that preparedness um, for the, avail the availability of the vaccine. It was a very good session there today and hearing from Professor Young and hearing that you know, in time the, the, the vaccine um, supply should be good and that shouldn't be an issue, but I, I do think it is right and proper. You, you touched on it too, Chair, that, that, that we are prepared and have um, the systems and the people in place um, in, in order to uh, implement that va vaccine as soon as it is available. So I would like us, if, if we could agree to, to write to the Minister to uh, appeal to him to, to, um, to take on that challenge of a 24-7 rollout 
uh, obviously being constant of, of the supply, so where the supply is there, that that option is there. Well, could, maybe it would be better if we can get Patricia Donnelly, and we have the minister. We know we have the minister coming next week. If we discuss with them the limitations, and then maybe look at doing that letter after we've discussed it with them, because I think the, the chief the chief scientific advisor indicated it was supply at this point in time. So, um, sure. yes, go ahead, Pat. No, Chair, and, and it's an important issue that has been raised because. We're already behind the schedule that the department gave us for the rollout of the vaccine. I mean, they had talked about 201,000 people getting the vaccine in December and another 458,000 uh, in January and February, another 366,000 in March. So, I mean, we're well behind as it is. We need an explanation as to why that is. I see some GPs are already complaining that there's a, there's a supply problem. So uh, and there needs to be a bit of transparency around this. Hopes were raised. There was a fanfare with the rollout of this, uh, and now people are, are beginning to be disappointed. Thanks. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. No, I would support uh, what Pam is saying. Um, I, I do think that a, a briefing from Patricia Donnelly urgently is vitally important. We, we actually did say that uh, before the new year. We were we were so displeased actually with the evidence that we got before in terms of lack of time uh, i think the new format will greatly help that but could i suggest that when we do have patricia donnelly here that we ask her if possible could she intend in person and could she be the only sole contributor to that because i don't think it will be helpful at that stage to have multiple people commenting uh, i think it's much better to have one person focused answering uh, the questions I did think that was helpful with Ian Young, but again, I always emphasise that where possible, it is better for us on these important topics to have the, the person in, here uh, with us in the, in the committee. Okay, well, we'll, we'll look at how those arrangements um, can, be, can be made. Should we ask the Minister to provide us with a briefing on, on the plans at this point in time for the rollout of the vaccine, including, including 24 7 and how it can be maximised to meet the targets that have been, that have been outlined and to can you include the non-trust healthcare workers, like the from allied health professionals, dentists, etc.? Yeah. Okay, members. Thank you. So, members, date, time, and place of next meeting may was Thursday, the 14th of January, 2021, at 9:30 here in the in the Senate Chamber, when we will be briefed by the minister. Thank you, members. Thank you. That was good.